Welcome to another episode of Maddie Eisen Chief. Patrick, we are back a little bit later maybe than we planned to start, but we decided to let Patrick eat some dinner. Uh, so it was either Patrick doesn't eat or uh, we start a little bit later and we like to let Patrick eat. So uh, that is why. Your boy's got to eat. Dude, I, this is the weird. So we're obviously, we're in the process of moving into a new house, buying a new house, selling our old house, yada, yada, all that stuff. So I have to, you know, I've got a computer, so you got to, you got to clean that off just in case somebody, you know, came in and steals it. Uh, so I can never get my desk exactly right uh, every time we have to show the house because I, you know, take my computer down and I'm like, put it back up. And so I, I, if you see, if you're watching the video, which you should be watching the video live on uh, Facebook right now, uh, or play it back later on. Uh, YouTube probably tomorrow uh, when Matt gets it up because sometimes that happens. Uh, it takes a little bit longer to do that because we can only go live on one. You can find all that stuff, all our socials on the bottom. So look down uh, if you're watching it live if or if you're watching it, period. If you're not, obviously Twitter, at MIATC Show, Facebook, uh, Matty Ice and Chief, Instagram, MIATC Show, uh, YouTube, of course, Matty Ice and Chief as well. And then, of course, you have our individuals, me and Patrick, both uh, at Matt underscore how I at, or <laughs> I've done that before, at Matt underscore Sindelar and at Patrick underscore Howie. Uh, I, I've done that several times, actually, in the history of the show, so that's uh, always funny when that happens. But follow us there, and you'll have an idea of what's going on. Uh, Patrick and I are trying to, as best as we can, tweet uh, on Saturdays uh, yeah. on the actual show account a little bit more. So if you're following that, you're going to get uh, Patrick and I's Saturday feelings uh, about what's going on. Well, what's more. good about that too is when we started doing a lot more last week, you're going to get our reactions to several games because we're not – we usually try to watch different games. Yeah. Like especially like – Especially like morning and afternoon, with there being several options. Like, I was probably tweeting about two or three games. And I noticed he was tweeting about two or three different games. So, like, throughout the course of the morning and afternoon, you're you're seeing us go ham on probably like anywhere from ten to twelve different games. Well, so and you're getting a lot of our different reactions, and it's not just all like circled around one and we're, lot, we're, we're trying to watch all well and a lot of times again non in a regular season sort of fashion we've done it already as a, a weekend or two um but in the similar household we oftentimes have four games going at once yeah. uh, <laughs> we usually have two computers and two tvs in the living room so patrick and i are probably watching different games i might have as many as four games going at once that i'm watching uh, so yeah, again, you're going to get a lot if you, uh, actually watch the show or if you, if you follow us on Twitter, so make sure you're doing that. So that's, that's all that Patrick, we're back for this episode. So let's go ahead and get into it. What are, what are our is backs for this episode? I'll let you go first. Um, the Phoenix Suns. <laughs> actually what's technically what's is back is an NBA team being on the market. We literally talked last week about Phoenix with everything with Sarver. Um, you can listen to last week's show and see how we, we thought about his punishment 
and all that, which, I mean, we understood why it was, but at the same time, it's still no punishment to him by any means. But just the other day, he announced that he's starting the process. We, he's starting the process to sell not only the Phoenix Suns, but also the Phoenix Mercury. But whenever, because you talked about your conspiracy that it He's going to end up selling the team so that way LeBron can buy it. Did you think the process would start one week later? Or do you <laughs> no. think it was going to take several years? No. Well, and of course, Bron's talking about playing until Bronny Jr. is in the league anyways, and that's a couple of years away. So I probably a little bit of time before he can officially buy a team anyways. I, so no, I didn't think it was going to go that fast. I figured we'd kind of – we'd get the year this year and then they'd find out, you know, they'd investigate a little bit more, find out some more and then go, "Mm, okay, well now that we found out this, you're going to have to sell a team. And then that would maybe when we might see uh, an ownership group. And look, I'm not, I still think that my theory could turn out to be true. It might just have to be like some shady, uh, shady, but not shady. Like, uh, shell corporation that buys it that LeBron has a good stake in, but he can't do and he can't be a controlling partner until uh, you know he's retired or something. So like officially, he's not an owner until he's retired. Yeah, rich people work stuff like that all the time. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I I did not think it was going to happen this fast. No, neither did I. But. Um... You know what though? I wonder. I wonder if what happened was there was a lot of sponsors around the NBA and around the Suns that were like, "Look, if something didn't happen, we're out." Yeah. Well, so it, it was it was Phoenix, I think, and maybe it was the NBA in general, but it was just primarily Phoenix that was going to be losing so much money and, you know, stripping their sponsorships that arena was basically just going to be stripped of everything. And the NBA, I'm sure was like, look, we can officially punish you this much, but you're going to have to get out. Well, look, I'll put it this way, Patrick. There's no idiots that are owners of franchises. As much as like we talk about people like Jerry Jones being an idiot, no idiot has that much millions money. of dollars, right? And and so what I'm what I think happened is is he thought, okay, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get this slap on the wrist from the league because you know the other side of being a like rich man like that, anything. Right. I, I think the other thing of being a rich man like that is you think you're kind of above the law a little bit and that, okay, this isn't going to touch me too much. And I'm sure what he thought was going to happen was, okay, NBA is going to punish me. Okay, sure. It takes a year. I'm whatever for a year. And then I'm spending for a year to find X amount of money. And then I'll be good. But as soon as he saw people, uh, sponsors pulling out and all that, he goes, hmm, you know what? I better go ahead and sell this team while it's going to get the highest price. Instead because, of losing millions and millions and millions of dollars, let me just sell it and get a check for maybe two or three billion dollars. Right, because if he waits until the league either forces him to sell it or you know, all the sponsors leave and you have no sponsors, then the valuation of your team goes so far down that, that it – you know, ends up costing you money. And now he's looking at it and he goes, all right, you know what, whatever. I'm, I'll, I'll make, make my billions and call it good. Um, so I, I think that's why he went ahead and um, do it now. Because you, you think how many, let's just stay in the NBA. How many NBA franchises have been for sale in our lifetime? I know Houston was from the last couple of years. Houston, Houston, the Clippers were bought by Balmer. Charlotte, Charlotte Bogart. with Jordan. Well, Charlotte when it was New or- when uh, they went yeah. to New Orleans, um, and then why, did they get bought again when they became the Pelicans? I don't, or they just brand twitch. Um, right. The Supersonics, obviously. Um, Memphis, right. uh, East- I, uh, Memphis, because he's been in the last ten years. 
As far as franchises go, I, NBA franchises come up a little bit more often. But I, I think that, that is partly because what you saw is, is that, what, 15, 20 years ago, Patrick, the NBA wasn't what it is now. Because yeah. – the NBA now is so much more global and so much more uh, – there's so much more TV money involved that, you know, if you if you had the original Vancouver Grizzlies back in the day when they sold them to Memphis, uh, whoever actually is the ownership group at the bottom, whatever, um, that team wasn't worth nearly what it is now. And so I, I think that's why you've seen a few more NBA comes up. But, when, I mean, you look around leagues in general, outside of, like, Carolina and the NFL, um, Seattle, I'm sure will actually be up for sale pretty soon. Um, when that whole Jody yeah. Allen stuff happens, uh, eventually, I, I know. Was re- recently bought for four billion dollars. Yeah, so I, man, I franchise they don't come well, up very often, they don't come up often, and obviously, there's not a lot of people who can actually afford to buy them. And, and yeah. so, I think you, if you're you know, if you own the Phoenix Suns and this happens, you jump on it while, excuse the pun, while the sun is hot um, and get as much money as you can. So, so they're a hot organization, so they're going to be worth a pretty penny. Yeah, so, so I think that's that's to me why I, this is back uh, <laughs> so quickly is because of that. Patrick, my is back is going to be really, really fast. Um, it's App State winning games on the last play of the game. <laughs> and we thought – you know, game day goes there, and you and I kind of talked about it that it was going to be. I, you and I predicted that it was going to be a very, very close game. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people thought, ah, it's either. I, I feel like a lot of people thought either App State's going to crap the bed and get blown out uh, because game day and because they won the big game the week before, or App State was going to blow them out. And you and I both called it that it was going to be a very back and forth um, struggle for App State to win. Obviously, that play that they end the game on is one of the most ridiculous Hail Marys. Um, I've seen in a long time. And I almost wonder the way that was designed to happen somewhat like that. You don't always see the guy cut back um, underneath the play the way that receiver did. Um, and, and so, like, uh, that was a little – and I think it was because they knew Chase Bryce couldn't get it to – couldn't get the ball all the way to the end zone. Might not have the time to do it one, but also probably could not get the ball all the way that far. It was a long throw to have to make. And so by having that guy come underneath when they swap the ball down, you got a chance to grab and get it. Uh, obviously, they have a bit of a history of winning games, uh, big games at the last moment. Obviously, we know Michigan, and, and they've done a couple other. They've had plays like that. Uh, but so they that's why they get is back. I bet you thought that was going to be my treat yourself, um, but I actually have a different treat yourself. So I figured I'd go ahead and get that out of the way. Um, so that is our is back. Patrick, what else is back? Another week of NFL football. So let's get into our picks. Obviously, right now we've got uh, Pittsburgh versus uh, the Cleveland Browns going on. I think both – did both of us end up picking the Brownies? Yeah, I – because in our in our group, our little uh, four-man group, I said, let me wait till the last minute. Let me think on it. But we all – the four of us all picked the Browns. And then in our official actual ESPN group, I made sure to pick the Browns because I'm really bad about not picking the Thursday game, but I made sure before I left the office that I made sure to pick the Browns in there too, which they're down right now. Right. Down by one. Uh, and it's a super winning night. You know, and this is – this is a this game is a good example of why the episode is titled. This is the hard part about live streaming is that I have to come up with the title before we've talked. And it used to be when we weren't live, I would come up with a title based off of whatever we talked about. So I kind of have to guess a little bit. But that's why this one's titled "Who Are These Teams?" Because, um, like, I, I think at this point, especially in the NFL, going into Week Three, we don't know who a lot of these teams are. You've seen a, a lot of ooh, big run from Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Big, big round of ball bat, though. Um, ah, oh, flag. I don't have my glasses on, so it's a little bit hard to see where it's at uh, in the living room. But Completely. ooh, and somebody's down. Like, oh, down, down. Um, Ouch! Is that that's not back there? I think. Who is it? I think it's one of their linebackers. Ah, that's not good. Um, but I, that's why we caught all this because I think a lot of these teams just. It's been very Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde uh, uh, so far this season. I mean, you look at both of these teams. Both of these teams are one-on-one. They've played okay at times. I mean, 
you know, obviously these two teams have bad quarterbacks. This is a bad quarterback situation game. Um, although we were joking about it earlier, you ironically have two guys named whose nicknames could be considered uh, after foods with Mitchell, Mr. Biscuit, uh, Trubisky and Jacoby Brisket, uh, which would make a fine, fine food item, a brisket biscuit. Me and uh, me and Kayla have a different nickname for Trubisky, which can't share on the air. Oh, I, yeah, your mom was well PG thirteen. Your your mom listens enough that you don't want to say that for her. But I, I, I don't know if my mom does listen. She well, just shares the Facebook. She likes us on Facebook. Hey, you know what? That that we're, we're on we're literally on Facebook right now streaming. So yeah, so we're gonna say hi, Penny. Um, every time, hi, Penny. Uh, well, so that's gonna be the thing. That's gonna kind of be the theme for this week. Is that a lot of these teams? Are, it's hard to flesh them out and figure out who these teams are because yeah. we've seen so much or, or so little of them, and it's hard to really kind of gauge what they are yet. Uh, so that's what makes yeah, the first sample size are. is just too. It's still a little too small. Yeah. So, Patrick, we both picked the Browns to win this game. Obviously, it'll be done with by the time most people have listened to this. So, uh, we'll move on. The Your division rival, Houston Texans, at 0-1-1. Oh, one and one. Well, if any, um, Anybody in that division of rivals right now. I guess rivals to maybe win a game. Yeah, uh, not a lot of wins in your division. Uh, but Only the Houston Texans taking on the Chicago Bears, another 1-1 one one team um, who obviously won in uh, the rain against San Francisco. Uh, lost last week. Uh, who do you think wins this game? I think this is an interesting one because you got Justin Fields. Everybody assumes is going to be a franchise. Kind of a, not everybody assumes, but a lot of people assume he's going to be a franchise quarterback for the Bears. And then, you know, on the other side, we've got uh, Davis Mills, who you and I both kind of don't like. I, yeah, you know, coming out, we thought this guy is garbage, but he's played pretty solid football for a team that's not got a lot of talent on the roster really and for me i'm gonna go with the bears on this it's a this one's kind of a toss-up and it feels weird to say because i think we thought the bears would be a little bit farther uh ahead of where they are right now currently they still kind of look like that mediocre bad bears team that we've seen the last half decade almost at this point um that being said, I think there's a, just enough talent on the roster. If Justin Fields has a good game, that's a team that wins this game and beats ten, uh, the Houston Texans. That's the thing for me. So neither of these teams really get it done on offense. <laughs> Houston's not good at running the ball. Chicago can't pass the ball. So that's it's, it's going to be interesting. I'm sure Chicago's going to – Going to try to run the ball a decent amount. Um, did that, did he just get body slammed? By the way, basically got body slammed. That's wow. what it looked like. Um, Never like when the guys get taken off. Someone on defense is going to have to step up. Yeah, because this isn't going to be your barn burner. Um, make one stop, and you got like someone's going to have to make some plays here. Both of these teams, especially Houston, is just bad, like horrible on defense. They allow almost 450 yards a game on defense, uh, but most of that's going to come through the air. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still leaning Houston on this game. I mean, they're terrible right now on the run. Chicago, again, is terrible in the pass, but I just don't trust – the Chicago offense very much. I know that early in that game against Green Bay, they made that one pretty decent drive. I mean, they ended up scoring, but that was it. I mean, that's really it. That's all they could do. Um, and granted, Green Bay's defense is a lot better than Houston's, but I just have this funny feeling that we're going to end up seeing Davis Mills being the much better quarterback in this game, and they're going to get it done. Yeah, you're kind of talking me into it. I, the the trick here is this one's tough. It's just I've, weird. I've, I've I've clicked both both teams three or four times on this one. Yeah. I, and so obviously, I reserve the. You know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go Texans as well because I think <laughs> to use draft terminology, I think the ceiling is much higher for this Bears team. The floor is maybe a little bit lower. When they're bad, they're bad. The Houston Texans. Low ceiling, 
but also not a low floor, but the gap is much smaller. And, and so I think you can see a media, a mediocre game from the Texans and a good game from the Texans isn't going to be too far different because they're just bad. A mediocre game from from the Bears is probably a very bad thing, and they're not going to have any rhythm. I I agree with you. I think I, I've got Texans winning. Next up, Patrick, we've got the Las Vegas Raiders taking on the Tennessee Titans, a battle of two zero and two teams. And I think if you looked at maybe if you looked at this going into the season, I know you absolutely thought the Tennessee Titans would be here. Um, I thought the Tennessee Titans would be a little bit better. Obviously, not the case. Uh, so far, granted, they did have to play uh, Buffalo last week, but got absolutely trounced. Uh, um, but they started off the season to get the Giants and got beat. You look on the other side, you got the Raiders losing the Los Angeles Chargers. That would make sense a little bit. And then they lose in a really weird fashion to the Arizona Cardinals last week. Yeah, that was definitely strange. So I think, again, this is – man, I think both of these teams – one, both of these teams are terrible on defense. They're so bad. If you if you <laughs> and look, the Giants may be better than we thought they were, but if you let the Giants do to you what the Giants did to them, I may have some questions about your defense to begin with. Uh, you look on the other side. I think the Raiders have played okay. Um, obviously, you don't like them giving up what was it twenty nine second half points to or however many they end up giving up to Darren. They were up big in that game. It, it, you don't like the comeback. You don't like. The, the offense lost its gas and couldn't really get it back. But I think, again, to me, the Raiders' offense has a little bit higher of a ceiling. I'm going to pick the Raiders to win this game. i got Tennessee starting off 0-3, um, even though it's on the road, because I think the Raiders have just a little bit more um, on offense. And I think what we're finding out is, one, I think getting rid of A.J. Brown and trying to replace him with Traylon Burks, even though we both like Traylon Burks, probably not a great idea for Tennessee's offense. Because I think – I don't want to sound whatever, but I think Derrick Henry is kind of on the back end of being an elite running back. Uh, he's starting on the back side of that hill. Uh, it's similar to how we saw Zeke a couple years ago be really, really good, and then all of a sudden, like, ooh, I don't know about this. And I think that's where we're at with Derrick Henry. They can't – they're not running the ball great. Granted, second game of the year, they were so far behind Buffalo, they were having to do a lot of stuff out of character. But this is a case again where Tennessee is a team that they're not they're not set up to play from behind, and, and if Derrick Henry isn't getting them ahead super early, they're not a good football team on offense. Uh, Tannehill's not going to do enough. It doesn't challenge a defense enough to be that offense all on his own. So for me, I think Derek Carr, Devontae Adams, a better. Group Darren Waller, obviously, you got a much better base of an offense there if they can just protect and get a little bit from the running game. Give me a Las Vegas to win. Well, you for me, I mean, one, the Raiders just have way too many weapons on offense. Um, and two, you kind of mentioned it. I don't know necessarily that Henry's on the on the tail end, but. For me, I didn't trust him coming off of the injury, of especially with him just being one of the biggest workhorses as far as running backs are concerned. He's he's not on the such a run heavy offense that him getting injured and then still relying on him just isn't going to work. But two, let's keep in mind the offensive line has been shaky lately. They haven't been able to figure out that right tackle position in a while. Taylor LeWan got hurt within the first, I think, the first quarter. Pretty early. In their last game, so that's not going to help them at all. So, with them trading away AJ Brown, with them not having really anything in the wide receiver position, trade Bur- I mean, Burks is going to catch on, it's going to take him some time. Robert Woods is a shell of himself after that injury. Yeah. So, what do they really have on offense, receiver wise? They don't really have anything. So, all you have to do, and we saw it with Buffalo, which I mean, Buffalo is one of the best defenses. So, I mean, of course they were. But all you have to do is plug in all the holes there on the offensive line for the run game, and you win. Like, that's how you stop them, because they're going to stop themselves in the pass game. So, I mean, you don't even have to stick to them like glue per se. You just have to force them to throw, and then that takes care of itself. 
Yeah. And all you have to do is just either blitz all day or literally just stuff the box, create no holes for him to run through, and you win. Yes. Yeah. I mean, those receivers are just I mean, either Robert Woods is just done, and then the rest of them are just inexperienced and rookies. Yeah. So, and then of course you got Tannehill. So, I mean, I mean that's all it takes. And that was my thought process going into the year is like that's all you have to do to to beat them in any week. And then that's what's gonna have that's what's gonna happen every single week. Yeah. So that's why they're gonna struggle. So, well, I mean, your Raiders, uh, Raiders got this one for me. Easily. Yeah. And to clarify just a little bit, I don't. I'm not saying Derek Henry's on the tail end of his career. I think. I think he's on the growing of his career. Yeah. Then he's on he's on the nether regions, uh, the family jewels area of his career. In that everything's fine until it's not fine, and I think we're we're hitting the it's not fine because everything else around him part uh, of the team is not fine, and you're. This again goes back to to my stance on running backs not mattering. There's no point in paying a guy like Derrick Henry that much because uh, as good as Derrick Henry is, he's a running back is still so reliant on everything else around him that you to me you pay the defense, you pay your quarterback, you get some good receivers, and then you do whatever with running back because uh, well obviously you got to pay old line because that is literally to me that is the most replaceable position. And you look around the league, and every year there's a new running back that's doing crazy good things. Uh, and, you know, you see teams that, that are paying big-time running backs struggle and struggle and struggle. I mean, look, how much are the Chargers playing, paying Austin Eckler? And yet every year he produces. And, and you know, I, how much are how much is Carolina going to have to pay or is, is paying Christian McCaffrey? Like, how much is Dallas paying Zeke and Tony Pollard does it as much, if not more than what Zeke is doing right now. And so I just, you were right at the beginning of the year, a team like Titans just not set up to be successful in the current state of the NFL. Let's move on, Patrick, your team's up next. And we're down to the AFC South, I guess already. I know we haven't talked about Jacksonville. Oh, one and one, as we mentioned before, uh, Colts taking on the Kansas City Chiefs and keep this simple. Kansas City Chiefs by 40. Thanks for the confidence, because I have Kansas City Chiefs by a hundred. <laughs> look, this Kansas City Chief team often by a hundred, I mean a hundred to nothing. Yeah, I, I think. Look, this is what you get for for not going after a quarterback. You and I have talked about this privately and with some of our other friends that when you roll out a guy like Matty, the other Matty Ice, like this is this is what you're going to see happen with an offense. And you throw in the injury issues with the wide receiver core the, or the lack of a wide receiver core and Mike Pittman now being out. Um, and this is just not as good of a team as they could be. Could, could oh, you, mean, you mean not addressing the offensive line whenever you should, not addressing wide receiver when you should, um, wasting draft capital and money on washed up quarterbacks that didn't work, a uh, coach that is terrible at calling plays and just all oh, shucks and sorry. I'm the good guy, though. Like, yeah, that 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 shtick's old. Like, yeah, I don't I don't care if you're part of my French. I don't care if you're a jackass. As long as you're good at your job, Johnny, you're all right. Like, Bill Belichick is not a nice guy. Like, he barely says a word. Like, he's not like this Jesus thumping, you know, Bible preaching guy. But he's good at his job. Yeah. And that's why he's won championships. Like, I mean, I'm not saying that's a bad thing by any means. Obviously, don't get it twisted. But, you know, that that's that shouldn't be why you can continuously be bad at your job. Yeah. So you're going you're you're going Colts, right? I'm probably not gonna go Colts at any point this year. Yeah, you and I might be in a very, very similar, similar boat the rest of the year. Uh, Kansas well, I, I have more confidence in Seattle than Indianapolis. At least Seattle's won a game. Well, we'll, we'll just talk about that. I'm not wrong. The stats show they won. You're not wrong. We have won a game. That is <laughs> next to have two teams that have not lost a game. We got the Buffalo Bills at 2 0, taking on the Miami Dolphins at 2 0. Um, obviously, Buffalo coming off that massive. 
win in terms of not strength of team, but in terms of distance between the team uh, against the Tennessee Titans that we just talked about. But Patrick, I, I'm actually going to pick the Miami Dolphins to win this game because Buffalo – Buffalo typically has a game – the last couple of years have kind of had a couple games, a game or two a year where they've kind of pooped the bed a little bit. And you come off a big, easy win like that, and Miami coming off of what they did to Baltimore. Uh, I, I think, look, this Miami team is kind of figuring things out, and they're a scary good football team. It's in Miami, so I think that plays into it a little bit. Um, I – Look, Tua's looked good. Tua looks like the, Tua looks look good. Yeah, the, Tua's looked like the quarterback that we thought he might be going into. It. Been waiting on. I think if Gabe Davis doesn't play again this Sunday, that could be another big issue. I think he'll probably end up playing. He's listed as questionable, but I think he'll probably end up playing. Um, I, I think this is just kind of one of those. These two teams are fairly familiar with each other, even though Miami's got a new head coach. Um, I think they're going to go in and do some things and make this Bills team work a little bit. And it'll be the first time that really the Bills have had to work uh, in a game. And, you know, they've won two games very easily. Uh, I, I think I think Miami can give them some trouble. Look, anytime Tyreek Tyre kills on the field, it causes a problem. Then you throw Jalen Waddle, Waddle on the field, another big problem. Yeah. Two is getting the ball to him. That's another big problem. Kaseki's looking better than we thought he was going to, especially if you go to our fantasy football draft, is looking better than we thought Kaseki would. And so I just think this team is set up to do something a little bit different. Now they're probably going to have to run the ball a little bit better uh, than they have been because it can't be as dimensional as they have been and probably beat this Buffalo Bills team. Um, but I think this is maybe the one where the Bills slip up and lose. So give me the Miami Dolphins. So I don't hate that. I don't hate that at all because, again, Buffalo's not going to go undefeated. Um, this division, we always see surprises. And the NFL has a decent amount of parity in the league in general. So it's not uncommon for something like this to happen. But I will say, and you, you made a prime example why I don't think it's going to happen this game. So you mentioned last week against the Ravens. They had an amazing comeback. That game was just incredible. I think that's why Buffalo wins. Let down game. Buffalo is going to see what happened to them. They're going to see that the Ravens were up big. They let Dolphins come back. They let Tua do all that on defense. And I think they're going to see that and say, all right, everyone's going to expect Miami to do this. Everyone's going to expect this to happen. Everyone's going to expect the shootout. We're going to make sure that we're not allowing this to happen. I think they're going to see that. Everyone's going to expect them to slip down a bit after that blow up win against Tennessee. So I think they're letting that play. If that veteran locker room does what they're supposed to do, they're going to say, all right, we got a chip on our shoulder. I know we're Buffalo. We're 2-0. and We just did this, but this is why we have a chip on our shoulder. They're going to expect us to slow down. They're going to expect expect Miami after that big win to catch us on a bad week. We have to prepare to make sure that doesn't happen. And I think they have such a veteran presence on both sides of the ball. I think they're going to show up just guns ablaze and ready to go. I'm going to pick Buffalo because I think they're going to be prepared not to be embarrassed. I, well, I, look, I'm going to say this. I, I think it'll be a close game either way. I don't think it would be an embarrassment for the Buffalo Bills to lose with Miami Dolphins. I think this is these are teams one and three in the AFC. If you look right now, I think these are one and three. I think obviously the Kansas City Chiefs slot into that two spot for me right now. Um, the Bills obviously being the better defense of the three are what put it at number one for me. Um, ooh, this game's looking rough. Um, the only reason I would, the only reason I say it could be embarrassing is because. It can be like predictable that Miami continues. Everyone will expect them to come down, and it's like, oh, I mean, could have saw that coming. And it's like, I think people are going to. Well, Patrick, I'll 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 say this: the Bills have been hammered hard on the pick. Uh, they're the eighty-seven percent on ESPN, eighty-seven uh, percent 
picking the Bills to win this game. So I'm in actually far in the minority. Another team that's looked really, really good at times and hasn't at other times, Patrick, the Detroit Lions at 1-1 one and one, taking on the Minnesota Vikings, who are also 1-1. One one. For me, I know a lot of people still like the Vikings. And look, Justin Jefferson's a great wide receiver. But I actually think this Detroit Lions team is a better team than the Minnesota Vikings. And, and you know, you look at last week, what happened with Kirk Cousins, I think it's going to be uh, maybe a little bit of a – Does it help? Is this a prime time? No, it's 12 p.m. kickoff. <laughs> I'm taking the line. Kirk is pretty, pretty hot dog water. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this will be a bit of a shootout. I think Amon Ross, St. Brown has another big game. Uh, give me Detroit over uh, Minnesota. I think the problem with Minnesota for me, Patrick, is that they haven't figured out how to get everybody involved real well. Um, you no, look, you're exactly right. They haven't. They have not figured out the run game so far, which I think. Oh. Detroit is not good. It's still not a good team as far as stopping the run. It's still not great on defense. So I think this is going to be the shootout, which Buffalo and Miami can easily be a shootout. I think this game will absolutely be a shootout. Uh, yeah, I think there's a good chance. Neither one of these teams are great on defense. Both of these quarterbacks are decent. Golf has improved so far this year against small sample size. But I think golf is much more improved with having a better offensive line, with having better weapons. I think this could easily be one of the most fun games, especially in the early slate. Yeah. This I'll is definitely have my eye on both of those games because I'm not watching Indianapolis. <laughs> so I think it's going to be can golf limit his mistakes? Can he limit the turnovers that we're used to him like making, especially late in the game? Because if he fits a shootout and he throws one of his classic picks early in the game or late in the game. That's going to ruin it for them. So I'm I'm picking Detroit as well. Um, but golf really for the Lions, golf has to be on, and for Minnesota, they got to establish the run early. Well, I think for me, golf has to be not perfect, but has to be on. Like you said, I think for the Vikings to win, they've got to figure out what was wrong with the connection between. Uh, yeah. One, what's wrong with the connection between Kirk Cousins and Adam Thielen this year? I really, I think Adam Thielen's lost. Yeah, a couple yeah of I'm glad you said that. Uh, and so I think that's a major, been a major issue so far. But I think also, if you go back and watch that game you know, last week, what where they really struggled is that for some reason, Kirk, it looked like it was like every single incomplete pass th- that he threw was to Irv Smith. And, and I don't know what that is. I don't know if Irv, Irv kind of has a bit of the dropsy. He's got a bit of a drop season. I don't think he separates real well um, from defenders. And for some reason, Kirk was trying to force that in a little bit last week. And look, they they did a good job last week bracketing Justin Jefferson enough that he couldn't do much. And that's not going to be the case this week with Detroit. They're not they a have big play slay in Detroit. Yeah. And so I think that's going to be a little bit different. Justin Jefferson's going to be a little bit more wide open. Once you get Justin Jefferson wide more wide open, then Irv Smith maybe gets a little bit more wide. You know, you, you start seeing the, the, the offense open up a little bit more. I still think uh, Detroit to me has the – I think more consistently good offense in this case. Uh, you, hope you make you hope you make a play or two here and there on defense, and you're okay. So we're both going to Detroit Lions with that. Next up, Patrick Baltimore Ravens one and one uh, against New England Patriots one and one. Tale of two different teams. I don't think I don't think New England's got it this year. Uh, this Ravens team. I don't. Look, Glad you agree. I don't think this defense is good at all. Um, I, I know a lot of people still want to. We talk about this. I feel like every year and every week that people want to talk about the, uh, the desperation up. signing they made yeah. today. You're signing Jason Pierre Paul to <laughs> be your answer on the pass rush. You got a terrible defense. I'm sick and tired of people acting like this is a good defense. As much as you and I have not poo pooed on Lamar Jackson, you and I are just oh, I talking about Lamar Jackson. We talked about last week. We're just honest about what he is as a player. He is the reason this team is good. Defense is not. Everybody, I'm pleading with you, everybody out there, stop acting like the Baltimore Ravens have a good defense. They do not. Baltimore Ravens win this game, though. They don't, and I don't want to say look at Miami as the reason why because Miami is going to be able to do that against a lot of defense. There's a lot of good defense. But that still doesn't – I don't say that say they have a good one because they don't. 
I would got a lot of stuff that they've let slip by the wayside and just say, well, I mean, we're the Ravens. We've had a good defense for years, and we can go without. Like, no, you can't. Nope. You can't go without, every, like, all three phases on defense and say you have good defense. You just can't. Like, you don't have pass rush, clearly. Who are you stopping there in that in that defensive back? Where are your linebackers? Like, that's literally all three phases. Yeah. Guess what? You're just as good as the Indianapolis defense because they're lacking all three, too. So, yeah, shut up. Um, good thing you can Lamar Jackson to uh, probably are playing just as well as expired clam chowder. So, <laughs> give me the Ravens. Give you the Ravens, uh, which we we may have to talk for a, a, at some point about the '93 Corolla that was Bo Nix playing like he had Nos in the car uh, last week for for sure, Oregon. We'll, no, we'll talk about that when we talk college. Yeah, well, when we, we if you're a New England Patriots fan, you might be glad that one of us made a, a wild analogy about a team because that usually means they play a lot better the next week. Next up, Patrick. We got the 0 and 2 Cincinnati Bengals taking on the 1 and 1 Jets and Elite Joe Flacco. Um, look, the debate keeps going. Look, the debate will never die. This Jets team is not good. Uh, this Bengals, pr- you can easily see improvement though. They're better. They are absolutely better. Still not a, gr- just a good. Because, just because. Again, just because you're improving doesn't mean you're good. Just and be, just because you're not good doesn't mean you're not improving. Like you can clearly see that they can move the ball on offense, defense. You can see flashes. It's not consistent, but you can see flashes on defense. So they have, they're starting to build the foundation, and that's what we've been waiting for with them. So I, you just got to give it time. I think. You're seeing what you can be with Sala as long as you keep giving him the correct pieces. Right. And we mentioned that just because you have an infinite amount of darts at the dartboard, that doesn't mean you know where to throw the darts at. Ask Pete Carroll. <laughs> Thank you. But I say all that to say I think Cincinnati wins because, I mean, Cincinnati has just been – They've been worse, somehow worse offensively as far as the offensive line than last year after spending so much money on the offensive line. I don't think that the Jets are going to be able to disrupt Cincinnati as far as that's concerned. I don't know if they're going to be able to get those type of quarterback pressures and get the sacks that Joe Burrow's been facing. I think this is where it kind of clicks offensively yeah. for Cincinnati, so I'm going to take the Bengals. Yeah, I actually think the same thing. I, I think that this this game has potential to be a little bit of a shootout, and in that case, I'm going to take Joe Burrow over Joe Flacco in the Battle of the Joes. Um, look, it's 100% dependent on what Cincinnati's offensive line does. In, you know, we talk a lot in, in college football previews and, and even in the NFL preview a lot that your team will go as far as a quarterback can take you. This is a case of your team will go as far as your offensive line can take you. And for whatever reason, they haven't gelled yet. And that's been absolutely an issue. you got to keep Joe Burrow on. If Joe Burrow's on his feet. He's a great quarterback. If he's on his back, I mean, he's as good as any quarterback can be on his back. I think – You can't be a good quarterback when you're on your back. Yeah, I think to me, like you, this is a game that Cincinnati kind of puts it a little bit more together. I don't think it will be pretty still, um, but I think they figure it out a little bit better. Cincinnati wins this game for me. Next up, Patrick, we've got the 2-0 and Philadelphia Eagles, who are flying like Eagles fly, uh, taking on the 1-1 one one Washington Commanders. I'm not going to waste a lot of time on this. I think Philadelphia's defense has improved over last year. Their offense is definitely more consistent, especially now they have A.J. Brown. And I think this Eagles football team is, is the cream of the crop in this division. Give me the Eagles to win again. I can see Washington kind of make a late fourth-quarter push. But at the same time, I have no doubt that Philadelphia, with Washington's defense, no one for some reason people are afraid to say it. Washington's defense sucks. It's not good. They were they were terrible last year mm-hmm. with Chase Young, and they're worse without him. Obviously, could have told you that. 
Like they're they're just trash. Like on all three phases, trash. So give me Philadelphia. They they've they've got the train rolling. Yeah, I, to me they look they look really good right now, and it's going to take a I don't know what it's going to take, but uh, it's going to take a, a lot to change that. Next up, Patrick, we got New Orleans Saints taking on Carolina Panthers. New Orleans Saints one and one. Carolina Panthers zero and two. Um, have struggled a little bit early. But Patrick, this is an interesting matchup because one, the big question is going to be how healthy is Jamie Winston? We know he played last week with what I think it was four fr- four fractures in his back. Uh, I don't know if if those are just going to get magically fixed either. So and he's going yeah. to be playing with those for a while. And then you throw in the fact that he's a weird four and six in his 10 appearances against Carolina. So he's not particularly great against Carolina in general. I don't know if it's the colors. I Maybe since he's had LASIK, that fixes that problem a little bit. Um, I – boy, this is one I go a little bit back and this forth. This is a strange one. I'm, in, I'm taking the Carolina Panthers. I mean, I can't – I can't blame – I mean, what is it? Right now – I mean, right now it's 81%. The Saints, as far as as far as the actual like pick 'em game is concerned, yeah. ESPN. But as far as matchup predictor on ESPN, it's fifty point six percent leaning towards Carolina. They're zero and two. They haven't really been able to get anything clicking really on offense. Um, so, right now, I have New Orleans picked. I just... The struggle is the struggle. The struggle is, is I'm sticking with my pick. I honestly am, and the reason being, I don't know how long it's going to take for for Baker and his offense to click. It it really hurt him that he got traded so late. Yeah, we didn't have a full training camp. He didn't have as much time as other new quarterbacks to to get familiar with the receivers and everyone. Um, it doesn't help that Carolina really just doesn't have wide receivers. You can't tell me Robbie Anderson's going to be consistent. Um, they're not really utilizing DJ more than we all thought. Christian McCaffrey is getting back to what we're, what we're used to seeing. Um, but I just think New Orleans has, has too many – opportunities on offense. I'm not saying weapons because I don't know if the offensive line is going to allow them to be weapons, but they have more opportunities. Um, And defensively, they're, they kind of play the same. Like they're kind of similar. So, and this is weird for me because I mean, I, I actually like Baker, but I kind of like a banged up Jameis a little bit better right now. So I'm going to stick, not confidently, but I'm going to stick with what I'm picking. I'm going to go New Orleans. So I'm going to pick the Panthers, and and I'm going to put the caveat on this. Okay. If Jameis Winston plays the whole game, Carolina wins. If he has to step out early because of the injury, if the Red Rifle also comes in, Andy Dalton comes in, Patrick. I keep forgetting that Andy Dalton's there. And if Andy Dalton comes in, I actually like the New Orleans Saints to then win that game. So I keep I, forgetting that for one, he's still playing until he's playing in New Orleans. Yeah, so I'm going Panthers uh, for the pick. But if if Jameis goes goes out, I'm going to say in the first half, and it, or the second half if it's a close game, Andy Dalton comes in and wins it for him. Um, next up, Patrick, we got the afternoon games. Jacksonville Jaguars one and one taking on uh, the Los Angeles Chargers. Chargers. Yep. Next. Excuse me, got to sneeze. Um, yeah, I, Jacksonville may have won this game. May have won a game, but the Chargers. We we both liked at the beginning of the season. Chargers won the game for me. Can we can I, just to make a comment? Because. We need to can, say something about one of these teams. Can, can you call the the Jacksonville Jaguars and tell them to give Travis Etienne the ball so that my 
running back in fantasy football is a little bit better? Throw him the football, maybe? No, because I have Robinson starting in one of my leagues, so I actually need him to get touches. Um, but I'm going to make a comment here. I don't know how controversial this may be. Okay. I like where this I don't is. Like, I don't like Brandon Staley. I don't like his decision-making. Okay. I think he is the reason that they were mediocre last year. Well, they actually were a really good team, but their record was mediocre, I think, because of him. And I think he's the reason why they're going to end up being mediocre this year. And I think he's the reason why this team is going to get held back and maybe kind of like last year missing the playoffs. Because they're going to keep finding themselves in one-score games, and it's going to be because of coaching decisions that they're going to miss out. I think he's terrible at con- and, and um, clock management. I think he's terrible at decision-making. I think he's terrible about his decisions whether to call or not call timeouts. Hmm. And, I, and when it comes to within, like, if they're in a one-score game within the two-minute warning, they're going to lose because he's going to make stupid mistakes. Well, I do not like him as a head coach. I will, I will say the jury's out, and I will have to pay more attention. Yeah, this is his second year, but as of now, he hasn't learned from all the mistakes he made last year. Well, I'll have to pay attention to that a little bit more going forward. I think they're a mediocre team again this year, Patrick, because that division is very strong. So, um, so that's a little bit of the trouble. It's going to be hard to tell. I, I'm interested. I, you know, I, I, are they medi- Are they going to be mediocre play wise or mediocre record wise? I think mediocre record wise. Okay, because I I think they very much could end up being mediocre record wise, and it's going. Going to be a lot to blame because of him. It might be. Oh, we'll we'll keep an eye on that as the season goes. But we're both taking the Chargers to win this game. Next up, Patrick, we've got the Los Angeles Rams one and one taking on the Arizona Cardinals at one and one as well. Um, I give me the Rams. I, this Cardinals team is too far all over the place, um, and, and you know you've got the division uh, commonality. They know each other real well. Give me Sean McVay. Give me the Rams. Win this game. Give me the Rams because Arizona's defense is just atrocious. Do do they don't? They're non-existent. They don't have a defense. Yeah. So All right. give me the Rams. Next up, let's move on to uh, the Atlanta Falcons at zero and two taking on the Seattle Seahawks, who are one and one, as you mentioned earlier. I'll say it straight out of the gate, Patrick. I cleaned a diaper this afternoon that I would rather clean. For 60 minutes, then watch this football game. These two teams are bad. I said it. Yeah, I said I would agree because I don't want to see, I don't want to have to watch this game and watch DK struggle to get catches when I need him to get catches. Look, here's the thing. I, <laughs> I saw uh, a weird, a weird stat earlier today. I think it's, Geno Smith last week was the first quarterback since I think like the 30s to complete 80 percent. Yeah, to complete 80 percent of his passes and the offense score no points. I I don't know how to look this up because I'm an idiot, but I would love to know, and you can tell me I'm sure because I didn't watch the last game, but I, it it kind of was glaring in that first game against Denver. What is the average distance that his passes go? Uh, barely. They, and I think you and I, I can I, I actually I look at it. like they're all such short passes. Like they're not really stretching the field through the air at all. Oh, when I say stretching, I mean like 10 yards. No. Uh, look, I, <sighs> Patrick, how many times do we do this where I have to say, I hate being right. I was right about this from the very beginning. So far, Patrick, he is averaging 6.9 yards per attempt. Per attempt. Now, that being said, let me let me go. Completion. That's just how far he's throwing every time. Let me let me look up 
other somebody else real quick. Um, I mean, not it's not going to be Russell Wilson, uh, who by the way threw to a bunch of tight ends and threw to the middle of the field, which was a big knock on him in Seattle. Maybe it's scheme related. All I'm gonna say, I, look, I, this is the absolute problem. You've got Tyler Lockett and you've got DK Metcalf, two of the best deep threats. Um, meanwhile, Patrick. Patrick Mahomes averages 8.1 yards. Well, he's averaging eight eight yards per attempt this year, which is in his career is 8.1, which is more along the lines of normal. Grant, they run an offense that obviously is a lot about yards after catch, anyways. Uh, so that is a little bit different. But I mean, look, the only deep ball that they threw really last week at all was the deep ball DK that got called back for offensive holding or whatever. I, this is a team, oh, Patrick, last week, they do, um, Pro Football Reference has an adjusted yards gained per pass attempt. His was five yards last week. That's not good. That's awful. Oh. I mean, like, uh, Patrick, he completed 24 passes last week on 30 attempts, only got 197 yards. Trust me, I felt every single one of those. That's you know why, right. because probably 10 or 20 of those yards went to DK. Yeah, and so the pro- what the problem is with the Seahawks team, we don't have to spend a lot of time on them. What the problem with it is, is they're not good at running the football right now because big shock. You chose a one. You chose an eighty year eighty year old court, or coach over a franchise quarterback. I let me also say, Patrick. I have heard what Richard Sherman said on podcast with KJ Wright this week, talking about the difference of how uh, Russell Wilson was treated by Pete Carroll versus how everybody else was. And all I'm going to say is, Richard Sherman, you sound like a an older brother who's up, who's upset that little brother got an extra cookie from grandma before you left the house. Like that is what you sound like. Of course, quarterbacks in the NFL are treated differently because they're important. And you know how I know they're important because the Seahawks got rid of theirs and they have Geno Smith. And it's one of the most anemic offenses in the history of the offense uh, in, in the history of football, because they can't run the ball real well. Part of the reason they can't run the ball real well is because there's no deep threat. There's no – Juno's not throwing the ball down the field. Like, that is just not a thing that's happening. He also can't he, – he doesn't scramble the same way that Russell Wilson used to. And so what then happens is the defense, lo and behold, they can key on the run. And so then they <laughs> – run they turn you one dimensional well when they turn you one dimensional geno smith's not good enough quarterback to change that any so they just end up in a okay captain check down throw to throw five yards throw six yards throw five yards throw six yards they don't do it good enough and Pete carroll still wants to run the football so they're still running the football and just not getting enough first downs not scoring points this is a bad football team that being said i think the falcons are kind of they don't know what they're doing at all. Um, they can't get Kyle Pitts the football. I'm going to pick the Seahawks to win this game, Patrick. It's going to be ugly. I'm not watching it probably. Um, right. Because I think I actually think I'm going to a baseball game on Saturday or on Sunday. But <laughs> uh, the wife's company might have box a box that I might be going to sit in for a Sunday. I'm going to hope they have football on TV. But. That being said, Patrick, all that the Seahawks in an ugly game. So there's a reason why I've tried to get Atlanta's defense in almost every single league where because they're playing it's against a better people. play. Because for one, Atlanta's defense has kind of been surprising. They're okay. Uh, I'm not saying they're good, but they've been surprising. Um, but you mentioned they can't run – like, Seattle can't run the ball. Gino, he's not bad at decision-making, but they're not – I mean, but they're also not going to just gain 250, 300 yards. Like, he's not throwing for 250. He's – Probably not throwing for 200. 
He hasn't yet. Exactly. Um, and on top of that, like, they're not really scoring much of anything either. So, if you can't run the ball, you're not really airing it out through the air. Like, what are you really doing on offense? I think Atlanta, surprisingly, I'm not saying the Rams' defense is great this year, but surprisingly, with kind of a makeshift offense and without really doing anything with Kyle Pitts, was able to, on the road, make a comeback against the Rams. Because they're able to do it with the run. Cordell Patterson is still doing what he did best last year. Mariota, what a shock, is able to make plays, run game. He's found his favorite target in Drake London, who I drafted. Um, I mean, they're able to get things done. Is it pretty? No. Have they won a game yet? No. Do I think it's going to change this week? Yes. I'm picking Atlanta. I look. I, I don't. I honestly, if Seattle wasn't my team, and look, Seattle's defense has been playing great so far this season. That's the real frustrating thing about this. Is I think this defense is fine. I think the playmakers on the offense are fine, and I think the offensive line's been. Okay, better it's been than improved. Than you tell it's been improved. This is a, I, I really think this is what makes me so upset about how this offseason went is that I think this is a playoff team if you have a playoff quarterback. And Geno Smith, he has that he had that quote after beating Denver. You know, they wrote me off, but I ain't right back though. He ain't right back because he didn't have enough postage to put it in the mail. He forgot to get he actually did write back, but he couldn't mail it because he had stamps. <laughs> That's stamps.com. No, we don't have stamps.com. It's not. I wish. That'd be, that would be so perfect. awesome. What could be a perfect ad read? I'll tell you what, I'm going to clip. I need to clip that and send it to stamps.com and say, hey. Hey, man. We had a would have been so perfect. I just you, sacked up. It's a show. Send, send some money our way. Uh, so you're going Falcons. I'm going Seahawks. I, I toss up. First difference. Next up, Patrick, we're going to get through a couple of these because it's getting late. Uh, Green Bay Packers taking on Tampa Bay Buccaneers, um, maybe one of the better games of the afternoon. I'm going to take Tampa Bay, even though they're kind of – Tampa Bay is kind of a sketchy team right now, uh, even though they're 2-0. Green Bay is a very sketchy 1-1, one and one, and I don't trust anything about this Packers team. They're just so – this is this is a game that I think I would, feel, I would feel very comfortable picking one way or the other if the, we were in like week eight maybe. Um not being week eight, not knowing enough about either one of these teams, how they're going to end up. I'm taking Tampa Bay. These teams are very similar. They're almost a mirror image of themselves. Defense on both sides playing very well. Like, very well. Quarterbacks are getting older. One of them is extremely ancient. Both of them oh, looks do younger. not have wide receivers. One doesn't have wide receivers because – the team just doesn't believe in wide receivers whenever they gave their quarterback a big four-year, 150-whatever extension. One of them has wide receivers who they brought back too early from an ACL injury. They have their veteran locker room leader who got suspended and can't play. So now they're relying on guys like Russell Gage, Rashar Perryman. They just signed Cole Beasley, who is probably going to be – have to be active. Yeah. And Julio Jones, who may or may not play, was out last week. So I think Tom is going to struggle with the leftovers that he's going to have playing against Green Bay's defense. I think Tom, it's not going to be great offensively, but I think he's going to be able to get things done because of their run game because what Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon can do in the past game. And I think that's going to open up to other guys, maybe like Lazard and Tunyon. So I think that's going to help them a little bit more. So, And I actually just changed my pick because I finally decided that I'm going to have the balls to do this. I'm picking Green Bay. Okay. Look, I think this is to, – to me, this is a toss-up. I, it's going to be like a 10-7 game. Yeah, I, I, well, look, I think it's if there's a, be, it's not going to be pretty. If there's a quarterback you want to have, 
to have to have a random white receiver like Cole Beasley thrown in and who will probably have two hundred yards receiving and eighty catches, it'll probably be Tampa Bay. Uh, I know you picked him up in one of our leagues, so uh yeah, <laughs> like as soon as that signing happened. I would smart. I'm gonna make sure I can because they're gonna need him, they're gonna use him. He's gonna be he's gonna have some type of relevance. He's gonna have a West Welker type game. Um but no, look, I don't think it's a toss-up game for me. So I, I went pack or Buccaneers, you went Packers easily. Sunday night game, we got the 49ers taking on Denver Broncos. Um look, I I think we're gonna see a better Denver Broncos team than we did last week. But I think Nathaniel Hackett's the problem. Head coach is the problem here. It's not Russell Wilson. Weeks two, it's kind of like Brandon Staley all over again. Like he's he, making some bad decisions. He is out of his depth. That means that on the not uh, ready. Obviously, we know Russell. Uh, the trick is, is that Russell Wilson knows this team and owns the San Francisco 49ers, like literally owns the San Francisco 49ers. That being said, I think the San Francisco 49ers offense is better with Jimmy G than they were going to be with Trey. Yeah. And, and I think they tried to force the issue with Trey Lance. Obviously, that sucks that he got hurt. Uh, I don't know saying that. I think they're better off with Jimmy G right now. I'm picking the 49ers to win this game. Um, I think it'll be close, and it won't necessarily be a pretty game, but give me the 49ers. Yeah, um, definitely with you there. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because not only this hack, it kind of has Staley syndrome where he's not good at those decisions, but it's kind of embarrassing too. But I kind of like it on the flip side because he's not afraid to admit when he makes a bad mistake. So it's not like that stupid ego trip that makes you just look even worse. Um, I mean, he's just like blatantly, like, yeah, maybe I, I clearly should have done this, clearly should have done that. And I think that's going to continue to ride um, as this offense kind of slowly gels a little bit more. Um, I think we're going to get back to kind of like the old 49ers that made that Super Bowl push last year unexpectedly because with Jim and G back. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're going to see more from this wide receiver group because of that chemistry that they have with Jimmy G. And I think that that confidence is going to exude in the offense. So I'm going to go the 49ers too. Are they a better offense with Jimmy G? Not necessarily. Are they a much more consistent offense with Jimmy G? Absolutely, and that's why I like them in this. Um, and to make a run. Oh, no. Uh, we might have to take a pause uh, in this episode. I might have to go take care of a little baby. Uh, I can go play dad for a second. So we'll be back uh, in just a minute. Uh, we'll see you in a sec. Okay, false alarm, at least for a second. Uh, she seems to have put herself uh, back to sleep. She was not happy having to hear about how bad the Seahawks were, uh, I think is what it was. So, Patrick, let's move on to the last game of uh, the weekend for the NFL. Monday night, we got the Dallas Cowboys taking on the New York Giants. Um, man, <laughs> two questions. Are the Giants, be another weird game. Are the Giants for real? I don't and know. Can Cooper Rush – continue to be to lead this team to victory i don't know i I don't know if i know the answer to either of those questions i don't i don't so all i'm gonna do is i'm gonna take the home team which is the year i'm kind of in that same weird boat like i don't know because like the giants who are there they played tennessee first which i knew i mean i i just knew tennessee's gonna be bad so just giving them the bump and who did they play last week? Um, play Carolina, another bad team. So, I mean, they have the potential to go 3 0, but against just mediocre teams right now. If it was Dak, it'd be different. Um, but 
I'm going to give the edge to the Giants again just because they're at home and they could go 3 and 0 and I still don't know how good this team would be. Yeah, I, that's they're going to be I, the most unsure 3 and 0 team that I've seen in a long time. Yeah. Uh, I, I, literally the only reason I'm going to take them is because they're the home team. Uh, there was a there was a chance that the old the wife's going to be in that area for business next week. There was a chance she was going to get to go to that game after as soon as she landed. Uh, it turns out she's not going to. I said, I said, good. Um, <laughs> so uh, that is the NFL picks for this week. Go join the ESPN Pick'em group, even if. Uh, even though, if you haven't yet, even though you're several weeks, three weeks behind now, uh, if, are, you, can, you can catch up. Yeah, see what your win percentage is. Like. You can keep, probably catch up. Yeah, because um, it's been a weird year so far in the NFL, kind of. So uh, that is that. Patrick, let's move on to one of our favorite segments. It's time for shame. Shame, shame, I know your name. I'm going to go first because we've already touched on it. Patrick, my shame this week goes out to the Seattle Seahawks. What are we doing? What are we doing? This is an utter embarrassment. (laughs) We can't be Trinidad. (laughs) Who can play Bosnia on a cow pasture? I just like all, I I love all those uh, Taylor 12 and uh, drops. Can I say this? We t- we talked about it already. I, this is just a bad football team, and this is a bad. Are you saying, <laughs> I'm going to quote a song by right now. They are who I thought they would be. They're they are. Here's what I'm I'm going to make up. They're what we always say about LSU. They're a quarterback away from being a very good football team, and they made the decision to not have a good quarterback. So that is why they get my shame this week, and they might get my shame every week uh, going forward if they don't do something. Patrick, who's your shame? Uh, my shame goes to Boston Celtics head coach Ime Udoka. Shame, shame, I know your name. In the actual original spirit of that soundbite, too, by the way. Exactly. Like, if you watch New Girl... Winston would a hundred percent say it in that tone to Udoka. Now, can I at least say, Patrick, for once, we at least have consensual sex going on here with with somebody in shame. That's that's why there's shame on both sides. So, for one, I don't. I still don't know if he's either. Dating actress Mia Long or is engaged to Mia Long. I don't, but I'm pre- I, I know during the finals that they were together. I don't know in what capacity. Um, I think they were engaged. I think they're engaged, which is probably going to split after this. Um, you would think. I'm sure. Fumble the bag there. But for one, you're an idiot because you shouldn't have done that. Clearly. Um, With my hectic life, you think retirement would be... Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, but, and I'm sure the, the whole reason why the Boston Celtics suspended him, I'm sure it was in his contract that you can't have some type of relationship with front office staff or whatever, however it's worded, whatever. But for one, you mentioned that it was consensual. So like it wasn't some, for what we know, some creepy like lurker grooming type of thing. Like, right. Two consenting adults. But on top of that, like, this is just a situation to where why does the whole world need to know that this happened? Because it's two consenting adults. Why 
should you be suspended an entire year for something that happened in his personal life between yeah. two consenting adults? For one, I'm not condoning it by any means. Like, I'm not condoning it, especially because he wasn't a single man. But, right. But at the same time, he's an adult. And he's an adult. Or she's an adult. They, they both agreed to this decision. Like, yeah. And, and it, it, I, I I see it where like you signed a contract saying you weren't going to do this. It was against the rules. You agree upon it and you broke that. But for an entire season, well, does it really condone an entire? I even asked Kayla before on air. I was like, "Hey, what do you think about this?" She was like, "Pretty sure an entire season is a bit of a stretch." Well, and look, I I mean, I, again. This this conversation is 100% framed around, uh, and I, I'm saying this so people understand for sure that it's clear. From everything we've heard, it was consensual between both of them. Could change, but everything is reported. They it was a consensual relationship. And so for me, that that allows us to have the discussion of, look, keep this in house, like. Yeah. Maybe sure, find the guy, fire the front office person, like not in a weird like because he's the guy and she's the girl, but because he's your head coach. Like I, to me, it seems weird to like legally. Like mean, you fire the front office person because it's again two consenting adults. I think you say like, hey, maybe you disclose this to HR, or you know, maybe you're both punished in some sort of way, but. I don't think in 2022 that that's any type of like fireball offense or well, should be suspended for literally an entire year offense. Like there's so many office workplaces where I want to take my office, for example, the amount of married people who work in my office is absurd and it's not like and granted it's not like they met each other in the office and whatnot right. but I, still like this isn't like mad men like the, it's not taboo anymore the the issue the issue is that if it was in their essential con it's, 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 right. well, it's got to be what it was that's because uh, some some yeah. places, some places won't let you date or whatever mm -hmm. i think dude I, to me like even if even if that's the rule, if that's the contract, that's fine. Punish them somehow, suspend them. Sit, maybe you suspend the front office person for two weeks, you know, suspend the coach for preseason or something for a couple weeks, and you say for an undisclosed. Yeah. And you can preseason, fine him a disclose, an undisclosed amount and just brush it off. I'm even fine with. Again, because as far as we know, nothing illegal happened. Like, I'm even fine with you just saying, hey, he's not coaching these preseason games because of family emergency and like PRing it that way. That's fine with me. I, I think it's a I think it's a bad move by the Celtics. I think it's it's an over exaggerated move. Um beyond over exaggeration. Because again, nothing illegal happened. They're two adults whatever. Like I, I'm going to guarantee you somebody on that Celtics roster is going to do something far worse this year. Like, and guess what? They're going to play and we'll, we'll never hear about it. Like, you know, how, how many of these NBA guys do you see like in a strip club at 3 a.m. on a road trip when they're supposed to be in the team hotel? Like how is Trey Lance in an hour, like an hour, hour and a half after, the loss to Chicago was in a Chicago strip club. Like literally within an hour to two hours he, he, in a Chicago strip club. He was just there for the breast and thighs, Patrick, the buffet, the chicken breasts and the chicken thighs. That's a whole, that's a bad with, joke. With the, with the arm full, literally carrying it like this. Clearly there for the buffet, like yeah. Ron Swanson. The Ron Swanson, but okay, that is a good shape, Patrick. Let's move on to our college picks. Um, I've got both of them pulled up. My picks and the actual way the confidence 
uh, is scheduled. So we'll go down the actual schedule. You and I will tell who we have and then what conference number it is. And we're going to go through these a little bit quick um, because the dad needs to go to sleep before kid wakes up. So let's get going. First off, number 17, Baylor taking on Iowa State. Iowa State 3-0, and much to your preseason pick chagrin. Um, I think Baylor's still the better football team here. I'm not sold on this Iowa State football team. They've not looked great in their three wins. Uh, so give me Baylor, and I've got them at number seven. Confidence. I, this is the first time I've seen this slate of games, and this is going to be the least confident I am in, almost, in probably any week. It's actually a very tough It's week. a very tough slate. So I'm going to go Baylor. Um, I don't know if I'm going to even disclose my confidence because I am going to shuffle it around so much, and I don't know how confident I am in any of these games. Well, so I'm not going to disclose confidence points this week. That's fair. Um, but I'm picking Baylor. Um Unless I say otherwise, I'm not confident in any of these. Right. Well, and again, refer to the the episode of this title. Like, I, even in college football, to some degree, we still don't know who a lot of these teams are at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, Patrick, we got number five, Clemson, who's three and taking on number twenty one, Wake Forest. Sam Hartman is playing now for Wake Forest, so I think Wake Forest is a very, very good team. I'm still not sold on this Clemson team, even though they seem to be doing a little bit of what they're supposed to be doing. I'm picking Wake Forest. I've got this as my one confidence, though, um, because, look, Clemson is Clemson, but I, I think this game's going to be a little frisky, and I, I like Wake Forest. I mean, it's at home, um, so I like the chance of an upset there. Clemson's defense is still just rock solid. So they are allowing a decent amount through the air, which is a bit surprising. Um, it's So I think Hartman – has the ability to take advantage of that. Um, I think Wake Forest has had this game circled for a very long time. I mean, it's Clemson. Every ACC school is going to have this game circled if they play Clemson, whether it's at home, on the road. Clemson always gets someone's best game. I, I, I like that Hartman is coming back for this. Um, Ugalele, he's improved, but he's still not like the guy that everybody's hoped that he would be. Um, I'll say this. At one point, Louisiana Tech was a lot closer in that game than anyone's going to acknowledge. Yeah. And Louisiana Tech's doo-doo. Um, man, I'm pretty sure in the preseason, I might have picked this as an upset. And I'm going to stick with it. Am I confident in this? Hell no. But I'm sticking with what I picked because really nothing has changed from beyond week zero to now. So there's nothing for me to go against that pick. So I'm going to go Wake Forest 2. And I'm definitely very unconfident in that. Yeah, uh, like I said, it's my one. You look at teams that both teams played. Clemson has played Georgia Tech, Furman, and Louisiana Tech. Not a lot of good football being played there. They've taken care of business, sure. Um, you go on the other side, you got VMI, Vanderbilt, and Liberty. Vanderbilt and Liberty are both okay teams right now. Um, Vanderbilt looking a lot better so far than, than we thought. They've been a lot more, uh, a lot better on offense uh, than, than I think we thought they were going to be coming into the season. So I actually think Wake Forest has played the stronger competition so far. Granted, it's been a lot closer, but you look defensively, Clemson's allowing 312 yards per game, almost 313 yards per game, and Wake Forest is allowing almost 315 yards a game. So actually very similar in that regard. Uh, Wake Forest is doing just a little bit better in terms of putting up points, or, well, putting up points and yardage. Uh, so, I, so Wake Forest, to me, is going to be more is more of a consistent, I trust this offense more than I trust DJ Uagalele and, and, and that Clemson offense. So that's why I'm going Wake Forest. But again, not very confident. Uh, they're my one, obviously. Next up, Patrick. Game day's not there. I think this is where the game day should be. You got 3-0 and Duke taking on 3-0 and Kansas. <laughs> and this is not basketball, folks. This is football. Um, I've actually got to find it. I'm actually very com- fairly confident in this. I'm taking Lance Leopold and the Kansas Jayhawks to win this game. I've got it as my nine confidence. I think they're a little bit better than Duke. I don't miss- – look, these teams are both – 
pretenders at three and zero. Um, but I think I think Kansas is farther along than where we thought they were going to be. Um, give me Kansas to win this game. Yeah, they might have finally found something here um, with Leopold. I don't. Again, they're able to actually score points in a decent. Like they're averaging fifty three points a game. When's the last time Kansas averaged fifty three points? In, in in anything that wasn't basketball. So, I mean, I, I think Duke is a pretty big pretender. I mean, they they played Temple, who – Temple's kind of garbage. Uh, they played Northwestern. You, I don't think Northwestern's any good. I, I said that. But North Carolina a and And you look at Kansas. I mean, they played Tennessee Tech. They beat West Virginia in overtime, and they beat Houston – those last two games were on the road. I think this Kansas team is the real deal. I'm not saying that Houston and West Virginia are great, but they're certainly better than Northwestern, and they're certainly better than Temple. I think this this Kansas team could be real. I think this is going to be a team that goes bowling. So, I, I yeah, I this may want to be the few games that I'm confident in. I'm going to pick the Jayhawks, too. All right, let's go. Uh, next up, we have where game day actually is, right? Uh, Florida. They're at Tennessee. At number four to t- number twenty, Florida at two and one, taking on Tennessee at three and zero. Uh, they're number eleven. Look, Josh Heupel's offense is working in Tennessee. Um, I am still not confident this Florida team is as good as everybody immediately thought. Oh, thank you. They're not. And, and, and so, I actually I like Tennessee to win this game. Where do I have it? Uh, I have Tennessee winning this game, and I have them as my eight confident, but confidence because I, I just think this offense is is rolling in the right direction, and I think Florida is just shaky enough. If Florida doesn't have just a lights out game, now, this is a rivalry game, obviously, uh, third Saturday in September, so it, it's going to be a tight one just because for a little bit at least, just because it is. But I think Tennessee is powerful enough on offense that this game might. It's not going to get out of hand, but it might not be as close as a lot of people think it will be going in. Can everybody stop riding on Anthony Richardson's jock? Because he's not as good as people make him out to be. No. He's not as good as people make him out to be. He's He's got what everybody is a sucker for, and that's the traits. Yeah. Guess what? If you can't execute the traits and be a good quarterback, then traits mean nothing. Yeah. And he's terrible making decisions. So why are people obsessed with this guy? Like, you can have – you can give me the tools to put together a desk. If I don't know how to use the tools, what good are they? And guess what? That's what happens when you give me the tools to put together a desk. Because I don't know anything about tools. What am I supposed to do? I'll have it together in 20 minutes. See, because that's you're better than me. You're better than me in that regard. And you don't even need the instructions. I need the instructions and then some. I'm the Caleb Williams of putting together furniture and you're the Anthony Richardson. Is that what you're saying? Yes, 100%. But again, like, he's extremely overrated. I do not buy into, into his hype. I don't see it. I've been a big, big fan of what Heifel has been doing in Tennessee. I love the fact that they got Hooker for another year. I thought they're just going to keep riding what they've been doing and improving. I mean, this isn't going to be much of a game. I think Tennessee wins, and I think it's going to be easy. Yeah, uh, really high in my comments. Okay, we'll try and scoot through these next couple. Minnesota, 3-0, and taking on number 11, Michigan State, who's 2-1. and um, Patrick, honestly, I – I think Minnesota might be the better team here. They're running the football very, very well right now. Um, I don't I see it too with Ibrahim. Peyton Thorne is turning over the football way too much for me uh, to trust that team. Um, you look what happened against Washington last week, and granted, Michael Penix Jr. played out of his mind last week, so that ha- that helps a ton. Um, and not like Minnesota's played anybody at this point. Um, I've got Minnesota winning. I think they're my three taking Minnesota. Yeah, I'm not very confident in it, but I mean, we everything that happened with Michigan State is exactly what happened that game against Washington. So it was no surprise to us. Um, you mentioned Minnesota hasn't played anybody, but 
I'm just more confident in everything that Minnesota has going on. Um, I think that Tanner Morgan is just good enough to win this game and, and just manage this game. And Peyton Thorne is just bad enough to lose it for Michigan State. So not high on it, but I'm going with Minnesota. Yeah. All right, Patrick, next up we got Notre Dame taking on North Carolina. Notre Dame uh, one and two, North Carolina three and oh. Uh, granted, look, they've played App State. That's it. Um, Florida a and and Georgia State. Georgia State's not terrible uh, as far as some ball goes. I, the problem is Notre Dame can't score enough points. Like, I mean, they suck. Defense has been okay, but Buckner, quarterback, has done nothing but throw interceptions. He's thrown two interceptions, no touchdowns. Uh, so you look, their passing game's not great. Uh, they've not been super consistent at running the ball. Uh, they're barely averaging 300 yards. UNC wants to turn this into a track meet. If UNC turns it into a track meet, which I think they have enough offensive talent to do, UNC wins this game. I've got my poor confidence. So, Yeah, because Notre Dame can't afford the money to buy track shoes. So this is pretty high. If I'm going to label this one now, this is pretty high confidence for me. I'm going North Carolina. It's not even close. We've seen we've seen what they can do on offense in the Niagara State game. They have the ability to do it. I don't even know if Notre Dame's capable of scoring points. Um, they struggled and almost let Cal come back and beat them at home. So that says something. I'm going North Carolina. Yeah, I, I was wrong. I have it as my sixth confidence, not my four. Um, but still North Carolina. Next up, Patrick, number 15, Oregon at 2-1, and one, taking on Washington State, uh, who is 3-0. and oh. The 93 Corolla turned into a Ferrari for a week. Does that continue? in you know, I'll let you take this one first. What do you think? I mean, at home against number 12 BYU, I know they had some guys injured, but they were able to essentially do whatever they want on offense uh, against BYU. I mean, Bo Nix played one of the best games that we've really seen him play in his career in college football. I don't see why it couldn't happen against Washington State. And Washington State can be a weird team, especially on the road. But if it was a night game, I'd feel a little bit more weary to just have it be a slam dunk. Um, I mean, Washington State's played Idaho, Colorado State, and Wisconsin. They beat Wisconsin at Wisconsin, which is impressive. I know Wisconsin's not that great this year, but anytime you can beat them at home, I don't care how bad they are; it's still pretty impressive, even like even if I'm still not really sure how good this Washington State team is. Um, I think Oregon is clicking at the right time, and if you're figuring things out against a good BYU team, then I think you're going to have what it takes to start rolling through the Pac-12. Who? Outside of really USC, who still hasn't played anybody, I don't really know who's going to be like the next team up. So I'm going to go Oregon because I think I think they're really going to. You mentioned that they they put some NOS in that Corolla. Um, I think they I think we're going to see after this game it wasn't NOS. They just put a souped up engine in there. Yeah, I so. Look, I, I think – and look, this is going to happen to a lot of teams that play Georgia this year. They got steamrolled by Georgia. Georgia's such a good football team. Georgia's clearly the best team in the country. I think that woke them up a little bit. I think I think Dan Lanning obviously knows the Georgia team, having come from there. And I think he had his team as prepared as he thought he could and as prepared as he thought he needed to be. And then they played against Georgia, and it was an oh, crap moment. He's like, I thought we were okay. and this, But it seemed like they've woken up. Now – that being said, Patrick, I think Cam Ward is – if this game was happening the first weekend of November, I'm picking yeah. Washington State. But because this game – November night game packed yeah. after dark be different. If that was happening, I would pick Washington State. It's not. It's early enough in the year. I think Oregon's rolling enough right now that I'm picking Oregon to win this game. It's only my five confidence, uh, so I'm not super, super confident because I think – this Washington State team can get frisky real fast, especially. Uh, but it's at three o'clock, so it's not Pac-12 after dark. It's a three o'clock kickoff, um, so I think 
weirdly that plays into it. It's not, it's not weird and not weird Washington weather, even though it's in Pullman, I think it's actually supposed to be a really nice night. Uh, if you look at, yeah, it's supposed to be 70 degrees. So it'll be, you know, seven degrees and partly sunny. So it'd be a real nice time. Um, so again, later in the year, I might, I would, I would absolutely pick Washington state and upset, but I'm going to Oregon. Uh, if I next up, Patrick, we've got the Southwest classic with number 10, Arkansas, who survived a scare last week against their old coach and Bobby Petrino taking on number 23, Texas A&M who came out and looked more like the team they were supposed to look like, uh, against Miami last week. This is an interesting one because I think both of these teams have had, had their game already, that they've kind of pooped the bed. Um, I think for Arkansas, that was last week. Obviously, for AM, uh, it was against App State. Not that App State's not a good team, just Texas AM should be better than that. So, this is my two confidence, Patrick. I think, though, that this Arkansas team, their ability to run the football um, and play a solid enough defense, I think is going to take them into this bigger game rivalry game and i think they're going to actually come out and win it i'm taking arkansas again it's only my number two um but hogs to win if a m could if a m had a passing game then i would pick them a hundred percent all day but they made the quarterback change before the miami game to johnson he's better but it'd be hard to not be better than Hans King, so it's not really saying much. Um, it's like, like you watch the Miami game, like you can have a tumor salad. Exactly. If you watch the Miami game, like they still couldn't do a ton in the past. Yeah. Um, but Miami just couldn't get anything done offensively. So I don't know. I couldn't tell if it was just credit to the end of defense or if it was. Just Miami just being bad because there's a seem there's just a lot of the dropsies, but also a and M scheme wise, just just seemed like it was just overmatched against a and yeah. So I think Arkansas is going to be able to run the ball, which they've done extremely well so far. Um, I think the offensive line, I. It, you give the credit to Arkansas over a and there, which it's shocking that you can say that. Um, again, to me, if Arkansas is playing against any team who can throw, has just a decent, not great, but just like good to decent pass game, then Arkansas is going to lose, especially when, now that they're playing SEC teams. AM doesn't have that. I think they're going to be able to pl- kind of play run run style bully ball. I think they're going to be able to do just enough, probably less than a seven point win. Yeah. But I think Arkansas is going to get it. Yeah. This so seems like I'm not confident. I actually just put it as my two. Um, so I'm right there with you. It, this but seems like a point game. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, it could easily be like a. a a one to three point game for sure. I, I think it ends up being a four point game. Hogs win, um, and but I don't feel super confident. Says number two, Patrick. Next up, we got Kansas State at two and one taking on OU, uh, who are number six at three and zero. Oh. Now I it it, it this is I the worst. Can I say this is the worst number six team maybe in the history of college football? Because I don't well, think Oklahoma's that good. I'm going to disagree with you there because you, I you, you think they are that good. I no, I <laughs> my wife's asleep, so I can say this. I don't think they're great, but I think they're a, they're a fine early season number sixteen. I think they're slowly getting into it. They looked a lot better last week. The problem is Patrick because I've watched all three of their games, and so oh, I've I actually I've actually seen them play enough football. I think the 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 talent is there and the roster's there for this to be a number six team in the nation. It's taken a little bit for Dylan Gabriel to kind of get settled in. I think last week they kind of started, they started figuring it out. Now, it bothers me that 99% of people have picked OU to win this game. And I actually yeah. have this as my 10 confidence. Um, I'm a, Because I don't – because I think we talked about this last week, especially with Kansas State coming off 
the two lane loss last week. This has all the makings of a trap game. Yeah, but, I know. Because, and that's and everybody's like, oh, I don't know. They lost the two lane. I'm like, no, that's exactly why it's a trap game. And the state has always the state lost to Tulane itself was a trap game because they were too worried and had licking their chops to pull off the upset against Oklahoma because they know what they've been able to do against Oklahoma. So it's a trap game for a trap game. I see, but that is an exception. Here's the problem though. It's, it's a double, it's a double negative. If Kansas state had struggled, but ultimately beat Tulane, then Kansas, but Kansas State oh, becomes a trap okay, game. Okay. Because they went ahead and lost, I think Oklahoma sees uh-huh. that and goes, Ooh, okay, so we don't want to be the trap game next. Next week is the trap game for, for Oklahoma when they play TCU before they have to play UT. That's the actual trap game. Oh, I so much, trap games. We talked about this. This was going to be a trap game. I think them losing to Tulane makes this not as much of a trap game. I think Dylan Gabriel, especially coming off the last week, uh, playing so much better uh, than he has. Uh, granted, it was Nebraska, um, so take that for what you will. But I, I think I think this team is actually better than I think they're better than you think they are. I don't are they the sixth best team in the country? Maybe not, but there have absolutely been worse number six teams in the history of, of ranking. I, I think this is a fine spot for them to be for now. Um, and we'll see if they improve upon it as the season goes on. But I, I think they win this game, and I actually think they end up winning fairly comfortably. I think it ends up being like a 16-point game. Um, whereas whereas before Kansas State lost to Tulane, I was thinking about picking this as an upset. I mean, I have Oklahoma. I, this isn't going to be the year where, like, Kansas State wins or they lose by three. Um I still, I really still believe that they're going to keep it competitive, and maybe even into the fourth. I don't, I don't know if I see it as like a 10, 14 point win for Oklahoma, because I'm, I'm confident enough to say they're going to win, but I'm not confident enough. Uh, that's why, I, that's why I still have it kind of low. Um. But it's, they're, Kansas State is just not – they're not going to be one of those teams forever. This isn't going to be a game where it's going to be like they always have Oklahoma's number because at some point – and this is going to probably be the year because I'm sure – and it would be smart if he did in a sense. I'm sure Venezuela is going to say, look, the old regime allowed this team to have your number too many times. The old regime allowed these Wildcats to either come in here and to steal a victory or to make you unprepared on the road and win by and squeak by. And that's not how we're going to do things here. So I think Venables is going to make sure they are well prepared for this game. They're going to know the history. The short history of Kansas State versus Oklahoma, as far as what they've been able to do lately, and I don't think that it's going to be one of those years. But I still think Kansas State as a whole can be good enough to keep it close for a little bit. But I still think Oklahoma wins. Well, I, you you said the words that are the reason why this isn't as much of a trap game. Brent Venables is the head coach, not Lincoln Riley, who we're about yeah. to talk about. Brent Venables actually knows how to adjust mid-game, which is something Lincoln Riley does not know how to do and is the reason they struggled in games in the second half and against teams like Kansas State. Brent Venables, if it's a rough first half, will figure it out before they come out of the locker room. And so I think it'll be tight for a little bit, but I think OU ends up pulling away at the end. Now, last game, Lincoln Riley, number seven, USC, Caleb Williams at 3-0. and Going into Corvallis, Patrick's take on the three and or three and O Oregon State Beavers. Who called that at the beginning of the year? Oh, was it this show, Patrick? Was it this show? We absolutely did, Patrick. This game is my number three confidence. You know why? Because I'm picking the Beavers at twelve after dark to give 
USC, their first real test, you actually see USC, I think it ends up being the it, this this Oregon State is the Kansas State of the Pac-12. This is the exact kind of game that Lincoln Riley is terrible at coaching in. This is the exact kind of game that Lincoln Riley consistent, consistently loses to a team that they really have no business losing to mm-hmm. in terms of talent. I think that the Oregon State team is good. I like what I've seen from them so far. They've taken care of business the way they're supposed to. I'm not super confident about it. I'm sounding the upset alert. Can or Oregon? I did it. Oregon State Beavers beat USC. So I can. Can I see it? Yes. Do I? Um, do I have the stones to pick it? No, no I don't. don't. Do it. I you don't. Coward. Do it, you coward. I am. I, that's why I'm saying I'm a coward. I don't have the stones to pick it. Um, I have USC winning. It's like a three in my confidence, and I might even move it lower. Honestly, um, look, USC has played Fresno State, o- Oregon State has to. They played Rice and they played Stanford. Nobody is a. For some reason, people are afraid to to actually dissect the Stanford game because Stanford had at least two possessions in the red zone where they fumbled the ball away. If they score on those two possessions where they were in the red zone, we're talking about a much different game than 41-28. Like, we're talking about a potential upset at home Mm -hmm. to USC. And everybody... I, I don't know what it is, whether it's the fact that not only is USC buying players, but they're buying the media. But that was an ugly win against yeah. Stanford. Let's just call let's let's call a spade a spade. It was an ugly win against Stanford. And this could be an if they win another ugly win at home. You it, it clearly has all the makings for a Pac-12 after dark. Oregon State we know is good. We knew, and you might have even—I don't know if I did, but you might have even picked this as an upset going into the year. I did. I'm I'm eight percent sure I did. I'm pretty sure I do, I know I didn't, but I'm pretty con, I'm pretty certain you did. Mm-hmm. So it's not surprising that you're you're doing it now. I just. I'm trying to beat your wife at this game. Hey, don't beat my wife. I don't want to beat your wife. I'm tr- I'm trying to to actually have one of us get the get the throne here. So I'm I'm trying to play conservative in a way, and in a week that I'm not confident in a lot of these games. Um, and that's why it's a three confidence because if they do take the lead, I'm only missing out on three points here. So the, the the problem, the reason I can't I can't defeat my wife at this a lot of times is because she goes to sleep before we get to college football. We need to. I'm gonna have to get you to get off work earlier, Patrick, so that we can start the show early enough so that she hears these little seeds like, oh, maybe maybe Oregon State will be you. Yeah. Maybe I should pick. <laughs> Because she goes to sleep too early, she doesn't hear my uh, my big upsets every week. But look, I'm sure she does. Is she goes in with her just regular knowledge, her her knowledge that's, I mean, her brain's bigger than both of ours. Absolutely, she she doesn't get she doesn't have the opportunity. She always makes her picks before we do the show because she doesn't want my, she doesn't want to hear me talk and have enough logic that she I can want to get brainwashed. I can I can talk. I can talk almost in well. I can talk a lot of people into seeing why a team could win. like. I, I as we're doing this, you're seeing. Oh yeah, absolutely. If yeah. everything goes the way you're talking about, yeah, we're gonna say could win this game. I, look, if you look at their schedules, you mentioned Rice. Rice is awful. Um, Stanford, not a good football team. I think Stanford and Boise State are comparable. If you're talking cross records, and then obviously Fresno State is their common opponent. Well. Oregon State did have to go to Fresno, which is a weird place to play. Uh, a lot of times, it's not an easy place to play, and so yeah, it was a little bit tighter. But look, Oregon State has done what they're supposed to do so far. Uh, they've thrown the ball pretty well. They've been able to run the ball really, really well. Um, and I think, 
defensively, they've been just fine. Now, you don't necessarily like that they gave up 28 points to Montana State, but, you know, a lot of that was at the end of the game, and so whatever. But I, I think, again, I, th- I just think this is a f- – Excuse the pun here. This beaver is frisky enough to beat USC. I think, uh, again, I just I don't trust Lincoln Riley as a head coach. I don't trust him in a second half of a game. And if if USC jumps out to a – even if they jump out to a 21-point lead, that kind of lead was not safe at OU. That kind of lead is not going to be safe in Corvallis. Corvallis is a weird place to play, again, at night, Pac-12 after dark. Everything goes against – all the weird heebie-jeebie voodoo juju goes against USC in this game outside of the fact that they have a better the better football team on paper. I think Oregon State wins this game. Again, they're my number three. You said they're going to be your number three. So there's that. That is our college football picks. Patrick, if I were to give you two seconds, what other game should we be watching this week uh, in college football? Lewis, you gave me more than two seconds because I was not expecting that. Well, um, we always do that. You have any. give me a little bit more than two seconds here. Um, it is a decent slate, though. I think Indiana-Cincinnati could be a little interesting. Indiana's a little bit better than I anticipated them to be. Cincinnati started off slow in that game last week, so that could be an interesting game. To keep an eye on, it's one that people are just going to say Cincinnati's a shoe in. Um, I think another game to keep an eye on, Patrick, is Texas Tech uh, hosting UT because Texas Tech looked a lot better against NC State than I think we thought they were going to look uh, last week. Gave Tech, uh, gave NC State a run for their money. Texas struggled for a good long time with UTSA, who we like is a good team, um, but. They struggled with them for a while before ultimately pulling away um, after some little things. So I think that is a game for sure to keep an eye on. Um, other than that, I, to me, there's not just a ton of games this week that are really, really good games. Um, yeah. You know, here's an interesting one. Arizona Cal. I mean, it's an interesting one. If you're a true Arizona, Arizona's played bet a lot better than I thought they would they would. And Cal, I mean, granted it was against Notre Dame, but they definitely looked impressive at times. Their defense looked looked pretty impressive. Um they still don't have much of an identity because their two wins are against UC Davis and UNLV. Um lost to Notre Dame at at Notre Dame, which that environment they they generated it to be a, a little bit more Hostile, uh, only lost 24-17. Again, it's a bad Notre Dame team. Uh, but to go into a really heavily generated environment that they tried to make um, and only lose by seven, this, to me, is really impressive. Um, I think they might be, be able to, maybe if they generate enough steam, surprise a team in the Pac-12. So I, that would be another one I might circle. Along um, with, I'll say TCU and SMU as well. Dang it, that's that's what I was about to bring up. No, I, I think this is a huge. I think that especially living where I live, obviously in DFW, like that is actually a huge game. Yeah. Um, and they're two very good teams. Obviously, Sunny Dykes coming uh, at TCU now, coming from SMU. Yeah. Uh, Tina Mordecai is already having a really really good season so far. Um, Dugan has looked better. Uh, than expected, I think, for TCU so far. He's adjusted that offense really well so far. Uh, TJ McDaniel is looking really good for SMU as well. Um, so, I, no, I I absolutely think that is that is maybe the game of the day to watch for me. It's not from our pick Um I, I love that game. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, both teams can play some offense and not necessarily a ton of defense uh, being played. So uh, that is is that so that's college football for this week patrick we are very quickly very quickly going to do uh in the show on positive notes time to treat yourself
right, Patrick, it is the best day of the year. It is time to treat yourself. So who gets to do that this week for you? To me, uh, who gets to treat themselves? Dan Skipper. Treat yourself. Um, former offensive tackle for the Arkansas Razorbacks. He has been in the league, I think they said, for six years, has signed over 20 NFL contracts, um, <laughs> has spent all six years basically on several different um, training camp rosters, several different practice squads, hence the 20 different contracts. Finally got his first start last week. He played guard uh, for the Lions, played a hell of a game. Um Dan Campbell made sure during their uh, post-game speech to just shout him out right off the bat. Um, you could see that his team loves him. He got huge chance from basically the entire team. Dan Campbell made sure during uh, post-game interviews, he was the very first one to go on the podium. Um, so for him to, for one, stick around for as long as he has, um, on NFL teams and, you know, multiple practice squads and all that to finally get his first start for him to do as well as he did. I think he more than deserves to treat himself. Yeah, that's, that is it going. Patrick, for me, very quickly, it is uh, FIFA 2023. Treat yourself. Why? Patrick, because they have decided to include one Ted Lasso and the team AFC Richmond from the TV show Ted Lasso on FIFA 23 as a playable team across multiple modes, which means I will actually be buying FIFA for the first time in several years uh, because I absolutely want to start a career as Ted Lasso and bring up AFC Richmond from the bottom of the English league up to uh, the premier league and ultimately winning the champions league. Uh, so for me, that uh, is going to be your, my treat yourself. That's going to be the show for us. Uh, make sure you're following us on all the socials again, down at the bottom. If you're watching the show, uh, if you're not at MIATC show on Twitter and Instagram, Matty Ashton, the chief on Facebook, YouTube uh, at Matt underscore single one at Patrick underscore Howie on Twitter. Uh, for both of us personally, again, we will be tweeting a lot more from the show on Saturday. So that's a great place to get uh, some of our college football stuff. That's going to do it. We will see you guys maybe next week. Uh, we're going to try. It might be a tough week to do that, uh, given some things, including getting ready to move. So we'll keep you follow the socials because as I get closer to having to move, we might have to move some stuff around and, and do it. But then you'll know when the show happens. That's going to do it. We'll see you guys next week. Feeling good all the time.